worship you, Lord. We praise you, Lord. We thank you for this morning. Thank you for your presence in this building. We thank you, Lord, that we can be with you in your throne room. And Lord, as always, wanting with you to give you an opportunity to speak, Lord. Is there anything, Lord, this morning that you would like to speak to us this morning? Is there anything you would like to say? in my presence. I want all of you to rest and enjoy my peace. It's why I cover you. So you can walk in that peace. Just absorb it right now. Love you. You are my children. Don't fear or be dismayed. I am with you always. Always, my children. I walk through the valley shadow of death with you. never leave you and never forsake you. You are mine. Trust in that. Believe in that. In Jesus' name. morning church so through praying and praying and fasting I really been seeking the Lord for this week's message and and uh, the Lord led me to this topic of discernment of spirits or spiritual discernment as I was praying this is the direction that the, the Lord wanted to go and and I believe it is important, it is an important topic for us really to meditate on, to think about, and to bring forth um, of the spiritual discernment for us as Christians to reflect on. Um, and with spiritual discernment, with, with personally, in our own lives, corporately, as a church, and prophetically, it's important to be able to discern the times and seasons. And as we are spiritual Christians, to understand and have some some sort of discernment of what the Lord is doing in the times that we're living in, and and, and th today this this topic will be more on the teaching side than the preaching, and and the first place I want to go is in in the spiritual discernment. I I, I really, oftentimes many in the church community do not see issues clearly. Or, or easily misled or make decisions that are not biblical or not according to the Spirit of God. And discernment is like a physical sense, right? It, it, it's a, but it, it's like it's, it's a physical sense, but it's heightened into the Spirit, into our spirit, as we understand the Word of God and as we walk with the Holy Spirit. To some measure, is given as a gift as we read in 1 Corinthians 12 10 as it states discerning of spirits and, and this chapter talks about the gifts of the spirit as we read in that chapter of 1 Corinthians 12 
verse 10, but we truly, we, 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 we all walk in the same spirit of God. And each of us should walk in a measure of this particular gift as it's essential for our spiritual health individually and corporately as we are the body of Christ. And Psalm 119, 66 teaches, Teach me good judgment and knowledge, for I believe your commandments. And there's this, there's this guy that I was led to. He was, a, he was an evangelist, and his name is Kenneth Woust, or West. Um, he was an evangelist in biblical Greek New Testament. A scholar, he, he puts it this way regarding this verse, regarding the discernment of spirits. He says, in, as far as 1 Corinthians 12, 10, the spirit giving forth of divine revelation or divine revelations and to another, the correct evaluation of those individuals who gave forth divine revelations. It's interesting, isn't it? Discernment is the ability to make biblical judgments and distinguish between and to recognize the moral implica uh, implications of different situations and a biblical course of action that is needed. It includes the ability to like, weigh up, to discern, as, as to assess the moral and spiritual status of individuals, groups, and even seasons and times that we're living in. And one of the greatest examples that Jesus showed us was in John chapter 2. John chapter 2 verses 23 and 25. Now when he was in Jerusalem at Passover during the feast, many believed in his name, Jesus, when they saw the signs which he did. But Jesus did not commit himself to them because he knew all men and had no need that anyone should testify of man for he knew what was in them jesus could see in their hearts he could discern that they were not ready for the full commitment to discipleship and the public identification with him jesus knew what was in the man you see, discernment is learning to think God thoughts after him, and particularly and spiritually. It means having the sense of how things look in or through God's eyes in some measure uncovered or bearing lay, like laying bare. We as Christians need to be able to discern the times and seasons as what is predicted or what is prophesied within scripture to know where we are within the timeline of scripture. It's important. Where are we at? Before the coming of Jesus in the gospels, there was over 400 prophecies of, about his coming. He would, he would, and, and there's more. I, I, that's just a, a conservative amount of prophecies. And, and these prophecies of his coming would be like, him being born in Bethlehem and Micah 5 2, his his virgin birth and Isaiah 7 14, and that he would teach parables in Psalm 78, 1 and 2, and his ministry would start in Galilee, as we read in Isaiah 9, 1 and 2, and that he would be betrayed in Zechariah 11, verses 11 and 12, and that his triumphal entry in Zechariah 9 and verses 9 and 10. So these are just a few prophecies. If you were a scholar in those times of the Old Testament, a Pharisee, and wanting and expecting the Messiah to come, you would know these scriptures. You would know them and you would have the ability to be able to discern the times and seasons they were in and, and to be able to discern the coming of the Messiah. In John 1, 4, verses, uh, chapter 1, verses 44, Philip found Nathanael and said to him, We have found him whom Moses and the law and also the prophets wrote, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. 
And also Deuteronomy 18.15 states, The Lord your God will rise up for you a prophet like me from your midst, from your brethren, and you shall hear him. Moses declared this prophecy about Jesus' coming and would rise up from among his brothers, fully human, but also fully divine, as we read in Hebrews 2.14. And Peter declared that Moses' words were fulfilled in Acts chapter 3, verses 22 and 23. See, we know in reading the Gospels that there were that there were disciples that believed in Jesus. We know that. And many others. But there were the Pharisees and the high priests that didn't believe. They didn't discern through the scriptures the coming of Jesus the Messiah. These scholars of the, of the knew. These scholars knew the Old Testament. They knew the scriptures. They knew the prophecies and the prophetic words of the coming of the Lord. To come and to bring salvation. So what's the point of me bringing that up? They had religious spirit in them. It was so thick within some of the group of people, within of God, the God's people, that some had a hard heart or hard time discerning in Jesus and putting the two together. Or, you know, Jesus' teachings or about him being the Messiah. Like we've talked about before, just like Nicodemus, the Pharisee. That he went to Jesus by night so he wouldn't be persecuted by the other Pharisees, by the other religious people in the temple, the church people. He went to Jesus by at night. But at least he had a heart to go seek Jesus and to talk to him. And Jesus is teaching him about being born again, as we read in John chapter 3. And in, this ver in verse 10, Jesus speaks to Nicodemus. In John chapter 3, verses 10 and 12, And Jesus answered and said to him, You are a teacher of all Israel, and you do not know these things? Most assuredly, I say to you, we speak of what we know and testify for what we have seen, and you do not receive our witness? If I have told you earthly things and you do not believe, how can I tell you earthly things? Or, excuse me, heavenly things. You see, the concept that Nicodemus couldn't understand of the coming of the new was the coming of the new kingdom. The, king, the new kingdom age of the working of his spirit, Jesus' spirit, the Holy Spirit that was clearly taught in the Old Testament. And a teacher and leader, Nicodemus, should have known these things. That's why Jesus presented this to him. He should have known these things if he couldn't grasp the earthly things that were plainly taught within the scriptures. How could he learn or grasp the heavenly things that only Jesus could reveal to him? The point I'm trying to make today is how many professing, professing Christians can discern the times and seasons we're living in. How many nominal Christians are out there to have a failure to understand of the times and seasons we're living in today, that we are living in the last days, and that Christians are being taught. You know, the, the, this is the question, okay? Are there Christians out there? Are those, those nominal Christians that we know that are out there, are they really being taught correct doctrine? Are they really being discipled? That's the question. And we need to be. You know, one of the scriptures that the Lord brought up to me, putting this together, was Matthew chapter 22. And, and verses 1 through 14. I'm just going to read it. It says, the, this is the parable of the wedding feast. And again, Jesus spoke to them in parables, saying, The kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who gave a wedding feast for his sons sent for his sons and sent his servants to call those who were invited to the wedding feast, but they would not come. And again, he sent out other servants, tell those who are invited, see, I have prepared my dinner, my oxen, my fat calves, 
death and have been slaughtered and everything is ready. Come to the wedding feast. But they paid no attention and went off one to his farm and one to his business while the rest seized his servants and treated them shamefully and killed them. And the king was angry and and, and he sent his troops to destroy those murders and, and burn their city. And he said to his servants, the wedding feast is ready. But those invited were not worthy. Go, therefore, to the main roads and invite to the wedding feast as many as you can find. And those servants went out to the roads and gathered all whom they found, both bad and good. So the wedding hall was filled with guests. But when the king came and looked at the guests he saw, there was a man who had no wedding garment. And he was speechless. And, and, and he said to, the, to him, Friend, how did you get in here without a wedding garment? And, and the man was speechless. Then the king said to his attendants, Bound him with hand and foot and cast him into the outer darkness, into the place where there's weeping and gnashing of the teeth for many are called, but few are chosen. Why? Why would, is the Lord bringing up the scripture in this topic? Because it's important to have self-spiritual discernment. It, or spiritual discernment within our church, within the body of Christ. What What is being taught? You see, this is part of walking in the gift of discernment, which all of us should have a portion of. What is, what is the, the spirit moving in within a church teaching? Why is this that and so important? Because this scripture we just read, it's all about salvation, making it to the wedding feast. Some believe they have read enough of the Bible and they think they know the road to salvation or the requirements to the wedding feast and relying on a pastor that may or may not be teaching correct doctrine. And may I ask this question? May I ask this question? Are you willing to bet your salvation or your eternity on, on a doctrine that is being taught? Do you know that it's correct doctrine? The point of the wedding feast parable is this many who appear to be to have accepted Christ in the invitation and claim to be members of God's kingdom will not be wearing wedding garments some may not some that's what the point is some will not have wedding garments symbolizing a, a condition of spiritual preparation and readiness for the coming of the Lord in other words, they do not possess true faith in Christ. They do not truly rely on Him and trust His Word to guide their lives. Do they, they do not truly, they, they truly do not obey God's Word, and they are not prepared for His coming. This parable is to urge us to really examine, to discern ourselves to ensure that we are prepared to serve God now and to be with him for all eternity. That's the point. The point is to, to discern first in us, discern what is going on in our spirit, what is going on with us. Are we prepared if Jesus came tonight? And 1 Timothy 4, 1 in the Amplified says, but the Holy Spirit explicitly and unmistakably declares that in the latter times some will turn away from faith, lying attention instead of deceitful, uh, seductive spirits and doctrine of demons being misled by hypocrisy and of liars who could, whose consciences have been are seared with, as with a branding iron, leaving them incapable of ethical functioning. So there's an increasing popularity of unbiblical teaching that has infiltrated or perverted the church, with, which is the result of Satan, excuse me, and his demonic forces of evil that has intensified 
and the opposition of God's work of salvation, the harvest of saving souls. It literally is, church, it literally is a war for a harvest of souls. We See, we see the doctrine of demons that is in our face. We see those things. We see those things that are blunt and in our face. Same-sex marriage, the woke agenda, even a spirit of religion, we can even see that. But there are softer and hidden, unbiblical teachings that are out there that are deceptive spirits moving within the church, like hyper-grace, Easy believism, legalism, universalism, everyone's accepted. Or that's just the name of few, but there's more. And Acts chapter 4, verses 12 in the Amplified says, And there is salvation in no one else. For there's no other name under heaven that has been given among people by which we must be saved. For God provided the world no alternative to salvation. And John chapter 14 verse 6 says, Jesus said to him, I am the only way to God and the real truth and the real life. And no one comes to the Father but through me. There is no, there, excuse me, there is only one way to salvation. And that is through Christ Jesus. And that is the case. As that is the case, then there is only one guide unto salvation, which is the Word. And He is the Word, Jesus. And as we read in John verses 1, 1, In the beginning, before all time, was the Word, Christ. And the Word was God, or excuse me, was with God, and the Word was God Himself. This is God. This is the only way to salvation. So if we're going to have spiritual discernment, then we have to know and live by the Word, the Bible. I'm not talking about reading a few verses here and there and thinking we're okay. Or I read through the Bible in 1984. <laughs> This is, this is, we need to read through our Bibles today. We can be, see, we need to be completely honest with ourselves. I mean, I need, even me, we have to be completely honest with ourselves. And everybody even watching, we, you and I, we need to be, we need to be honest with ourselves. And truly ask ourselves, do I really know the Bible? Do I really know the New Testament? Do I really know the scriptures? If a speaker came into your church and preached a message that was false, would you be able to recognize it? Are we truly teaching our kids and family and people that are around us true doctrine of the Bible, or are we watering it down to fit them? Is our church teaching correct doctrine of the entire Bible, and yes, including the Old Testament? See, there are hundreds of demons that have infiltrated the church that bring false doctrine, like Ahab's spirit, the spirit of Jezebel, the spirit of Delilah, the spirit of Mammon, the spirit of lust, the spirit of perversion, fornication, the spirit of self-righteousness, the spirit of pride, even the Antichrist spirit, and witchcraft. And now, we're at the times we're living in, the New Age spirit that believes in reincarnation, astrology, psychics, and the presence of spiritual energy, like salt rocks and yoga. Yeah, I called it out. Just like, just to name a few. And how is it that we have allowed the devil to infiltrate our churches and we think it's okay, that it doesn't matter. It won't harm us. And all it's doing is opening up the door to demons to come into that place 
that we're supposed to worship God. We're supposed to worship the Almighty God and we're allowing these things. So what I'm saying is, has our spiritual discernment as a church been seared? In the Old Testament, we, we read in the Old Testament, right, many times how the Israelites allowed pagan idols or pagan worship in the temple. And how did that pan out for them? Not very well. What happened was God destroyed each temple. And God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And He's calling us to be holy as He is holy. And 1 Peter 1, verses 15 and 16 says, Be like the Holy One who called you. Be holy yourselves in all your conduct and be set apart from the world. Be set apart by your godly character and moral courage. Because it is written, You shall be holy set apart for I am holy. Leviticus chapter 11 verses 44. Before we can discern the spirits that are moving around within people, we need to be able to be humble and teachable and discern eternally and see what's going on with ourselves before we can even move on to anyone else. It starts with us. That's where it starts. If we have issues in us, God will not give us more power. He will not give you more authority or give us more authority. or And He won't give us more spiritual gifts just so we can potentially hurt people or harm people that He loves. See, if we want to have spiritual discernment, it starts with us being prostrate before the Lord, removing our crowns and bowing at His feet. Which reminds me of one of the greatest moves of God that I, all, I, I just love. I've read and studied and just love it. Which was from a man that put a box over his head while he preached so that he would not look at the faces of people and be persuaded by what they thought. He didn't want to be persuaded from what the Father wanted to say through him. And what was his name? William Seymour. The, the Azusa Street Revival. One of the greatest revivals in 1904 and 1906. That was an act of being humble and being prostrate before the Lord. If, if we just create an, an environment, if we just create an environment in our homes, in our churches, our places of worship that will house His glory, He will do the rest. Being kingdom-minded is, is prosperous, right? Prosperity is being kingdom-minded. If we want to be prosperous, we need to study the Sermon on the Mount. The Sermon on the Mount that Jesus taught in Matthew chapter 5. And see, there are many that are spiritually inept of discernment. As like the Pharisees who couldn't discern that Jesus was the Messiah. They were, they were doing all the temple work. They were checking all the boxes. They were doing their religious acts, but couldn't discern the biblical times that they were living in. They were more concerned about the temple the building and making money than actually worshiping God. And this truly upset Jesus. So much so that he went into the temple, overturned tables, and actually whipped people. And we read that in John chapter 2, verses 15 and 17. The spiritually prosperous people that the Lord blesses is this. A broken and contrite heart, destitute without the Lord, and not afraid to confess it. And Psalm 51, 17 says, My only sacrifice acceptable to God is a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart, broken in sorrow for sin, thoroughly penitent, such, O oh God, you will not despise. It's always the opposite with God. When we humble ourselves, God lifts us up. 1 Corinthians verse, uh, chapter 2, verse 2 says, For I have determined 
not to know anything among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. That was Paul. And he wrote second. He's the second man. To, Luke, word for word, wrote most of the New Testament, word for word. But Paul wrote more books. But this is a mighty man of God. And that's what he said. What is Paul saying here? He's saying, I decided, I, I decided in my own will, my own thoughts, not to do anything among you except Jesus Christ and this, this very one who was crucified. And as far as for my message and my preaching were not crouched in special words of philosophy, but were dependent for the efficacy upon the demonstration of the spirit of power in order that your faith should not be resting in human philosophy, but in God's power. That's Paul. So when we look at the spirits moving upon the, the world, right? There are, are three spirits moving within the world. The Holy Spirit, evil spirit, and the spirit of humans or the spirit of man. And we need to discern, and even in our own spirit, what our own desires are. What is what's discern our own heart for the for the world or for pleasing God? See, the Bible is real, and we are. And, and as we are claiming to be children of God, we shall look like Him and talk like Him. And, and, and look like him and walk like him and talk like him and we and as such our heart should be to please him see as we have settled these things out and this message we've kind of built the foundation okay we settled this out now uh, it's it's walking in the footsteps of Jesus and walking in his spirit and as we do we'll have the the, the, the ability to be able to see in the spiritual realm. To be able to discern what is going on in the spiritual realm. And to see it accurately. Not from a twisted thinking or twisted heart that might be in us. As I stated, there are three spirits moving and active in the world. The Holy Spirit, evil spirit, and the spirit of man. And and we need eyes to see what spirit is moving and operating in any given moment. But see, I, we have to lay the foundation of purity and holiness and really seeking the Lord and what is in us before we can move on to actually functioning correctly within any given spirit or any, excuse me, with any, any a given gift, right? Paul had the ability to discern of the spirits as we read in Acts chapter 16 verse 16 there was a woman possessed by a demon acting as a seer and she was speaking about Paul and Silas and there were and with their preaching of truth of salvation she was speaking truth but from the wrong spirit a wrong evil spirit shouting and marketing the gospel in such manner so he commanded that spirit to come out Paul discerned that the enemy was trying to use her as a seer to speak through her that she would seem higher or lifted up than even Paul. Or that this right that she was hearing from God, but she wasn't. She was just she was just working from knowledge, not from prophecy. We also need to discern the human spirit that is operating within a person as in Jeremiah 28. Right? Not only do we need to discern evil spirits, what is functioning in the demonic realm, right? Like Paul did, as we just read. But we also need to be able to discern and function what's going on within a human spirit. As we read in Jeremiah 28, where the prophet Hananiah, Hananiah spoke falsely concerning the welfare of Israel, that God would restore Israel in two years and bring back all the vessels of the temple and this is where God, where Israel was about to be removed from Israel and go to Babylon for 70 years. But Hananiah was speaking from his own spirit. He wasn't speaking from the Holy Spirit. And Jeremiah picked up on it. He was, 
Jeremiah to discern the spirit moving within Hananiah. And that it was only his own spirit, his flesh, not the Lord speaking, and told him, you are making people believe in a lie. And the Lord said, I will cast you from the face of the earth. Thus, this shows us how much we need to have the ability to discern the spirits operating within a person, especially within the prophetic realm, especially within the, the prophets. What spirit is moving in within that person? Is it a spirit of man or is it actually the Holy Spirit? It's important because we, we, we like, especially in these days, we like to listen to the prophets. We like, what is the Lord saying? What is the Lord speaking? What is the next season? What is God doing? But are, do we have the ability to discern? Is that from the Lord or is that the flesh of the man? And we also need to be, have the ability to discern the spirits operating in sickness. As we read in Luke 13, verse 11, And behold, there was a woman who had a spirit of infirmity for 18 years and was bent over and could not rise herself. But when Jesus saw her, he called her to him and said to her, Woman, you are loosed from that infirmity. And he laid hands on her, and immediately she was made straight and glorified God. See, we need to learn and exercise and develop the discerning discernment of spirits and we and we need to develop and how we develop it is is through the word of god that's where we start we start to develop it by the word of god and the word of god is the way we receive revelation revelation of the gifts of the spirit and prayer activates it in second peter verse 1 Verse 2 says, Grace and peace, that special sense of spiritual well-being, be multiplied to you in true intimate knowledge of God and of Jesus Christ. See, through the knowledge of, of the Lord, we receive the knowledge of everything that pertains to this life. Through His Word and our prayer life, we gain the knowledge of God. We gain the, the things that we do, do not know and the ability to see in the spiritual realm. The word, look at it this way, the, the, this Bible is fuel. This is fuel. We read it, we get revelation, we receive it and activate it. This is a fuel in our spirit. We absorb it into our spirit. And prayer is the, is the ignition that is the power behind the word. In 2 Corinthians 11, verses 14 and 15, says, And no wonder, for Satan himself transforms himself into an angel of light. Therefore, it is no great thing that his ministers, demons, transform themselves into ministers of righteousness, whose end will be according to their work. Wolves in sheep clothing. So we must be aware, being sober, walking in the Spirit of God about the nature and deceptiveness of evil. We must always pray and ask God for discernment and spiritual wisdom because things are not always what they seem or appear to be. Particularly things that may seem to be good and innocent and pleasing and beneficial as we read in our Bibles about Adam and Eve. <laughs> that's, that's where it starts. As we truly read about having spiritual discernment that apparently they didn't have. As we read in the scripture, there was some truth of what Satan was saying to them, but it denied some biblical element of truth. See, this, this is true of people this is true of organizations, even ministries, teachers, and political strategies. The internet, and especially church, with AI coming out. Or, or anything else that tries to influence uh, people in any way. There's going to be some deception there. But God, but God, and we, the church have the Holy Spirit. 
when it comes down to it, with this message, we need to be flowing in the Spirit, walking in the Spirit of God, and our own lives. And how do we achieve that? Holiness, consecration, humility, bowing our, down to the Lord's feet, taking our crowns off, being humble, being teachable, seeking the Lord with all our hearts through the Word and in our prayer closet. In our prayer life, it's not just once and done. It's daily. As the Word says, take up my cross daily. And so how are we going to have that discernment be heightened or be top notch or, you know, at its full capacity if we're not in the Word, really reading it, really studying it, really being in the presence of God, really being in our prayer life, really seeking holiness and being honest with ourselves first and say, Lord, I know as a church, most of us are not in the Bible as much as we should be. And I'm just being real. And, and I, you know, even with myself, right, we need to be more. You know, like those guys, um, uh, like John G. Lake or, or people that we... We're mighty men and women, you know, of, of, in the olden times. Kuman, Miss Kuman, she was a mighty woman of God. What did they all have in common? Man, they were always with the Lord, as much as humanly possible. And we really need to be honest with ourselves and honest with the Lord. And because when we walk in humility and walk in the presence of God, that's how these gifts are flow in a miraculous supernatural ways. And we won't be deceived. That's the point of this message is when we think about the discernment of spirits is what? This is protection. This is protection for me. This is protection for all of you. This is protection over you who are watching protection is the discernment of spirits why our salvation not only our own salvation that's where it starts but the people around us our children our co-workers our churches are we really being real and humble and asking the lord what is wrong you know is there anything that needs to be worked out it's protection especially us as leaders we have, we're covering other people. And if we're not walking into discernment or teaching the truth of God's word, we're responsible for it. We are. It, the word says we will be held accountable for it. So that's, this, is, this is just kind of like a, a warning word. Because why? We know Jesus is coming soon. We can discern in the times and seasons that we're living in, what's going on in the population and the earth, even the earth is growling and birth pains, that Jesus is coming soon. So what do we need to do? We need to make sure our wedding garments are clean and we're concentrated and holy and seeking the Lord. So we, we just need to seek the Lord with all our hearts through, through the word and in our, in our prayer life. And it's all of our individual choice. It's your choice. It's your choice. If you're going to be teachable, being humble, and being in the Word, and being praying, it's your choice. It's your choice of how close you want to get to the Lord. But as we do, we will flow in these gifts, and it will be amazing. Why? Because we'll, we'll, we'll have that protection of discernment. We'll be able to flow, we'll be able to help people, and we'll be able to honor God and give Him all the glory which He deserves, right? Amen. So I really pray this message has blessed you today and has brought something in your life to attention that you need to work on and in your life, as we all do. <laughs> None of us have arrived and we all can get better, right? And, and we all can get better at serving the Lord, walking in power and authority of our Christ, our King, Jesus. Amen. We got this, church. We got this. We just need to hone it in a little bit 
and sharpen our swords. And uh, as we apply all these things that I talked about today, we will glorify Jesus. Amen. Amen. So, Lord, I thank you, Father, for this message. Lord, I thank you, Father, that you're always covering us. This is part of this message, Lord, that you're covering us. You're wanting us to walk that narrow path and keep us on that path, Lord, and be strong and be courageous and be clean. And, and just know, Lord, Father, that we're walking exactly how you want us to walk, Lord. But I pray that all of us, Lord, would seek you this week as we hear this message to really first go to ourselves through you, with you, in our prayer life and say, Lord, I want to be teachable. I want to be humble. I cast my crown at your feet, Lord. What is what does I need to work on? Where are some areas that I need to sharpen, Lord? Where am I lacking or where am I doing good? Lord, help me, guide me, Lord, so I can walk in my full potential. Help me first, Lord, so I can be, be a servant and be able to help others. But it starts with us, and I pray that we'd really reflect on ourselves this week and ask the Lord what's going on in us, and, and just so that way we can be in right standing with God. So I thank you, Father. We love you. We praise you. We honor you, Lord. And we, we just, we will, we will worship you and praise you Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday until we come to church next week. We will worship you and praise you every day of our lives. We love you, Lord. We thank you. pray in Jesus' name. May the Lord bless you. May the Lord keep you. May the Lord's face shine upon you and be gracious to you and give you everlasting peace. Remember, church, read and study your Bibles. Pray without ceasing. Be the salt. Be the light. Preach to all who have ears to hear. And remember, you can never go wrong if you listen and obey God. Amen. Well, bless you guys.